Proverbs 6, verse number 1, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, look what he's saying here. He's starting out by talking about being surety. Surety is another way of saying uh, to guarantee or to mortgage or to promise. Um, this word is used in finances even still today. We may not use it in our common language, but it, it makes sense when you think about it like that. You're saying it's kind of like being a co-signer, like swearing for somebody else's debt or, or swearing something for a debt. And he's warning here about swearing for a friend. And, you know, honestly, as a Christian, you need to be careful being a co-signer for somebody else's debt. If you have done that or you do that, you be prepared to just eat the debt yourself, to just take it upon yourself because you're making promises for others and they may not be able to fulfill that. And look, you know, there are times in life where you may need a, a hand up and somebody may give you a help and help you move along in life and that's, that's good and well. We ought to do that. We ought to try to help people. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is, if somebody, you know, if... You know, if somebody came to me tomorrow and they said, well, look, I need a car and my credit score is terrible and will you go co-sign with me? Now, I would give help, but it might not be the help they wanted. Personally, I would say, well, let's look at your finances, right? Let's look at your budget. Let's look at your credit score. And let's look at the type of a car you want to get. Right? Maybe you ought to go to the buy here, pay here and get you a $2,000 clunker and then go trade that in in a few months instead of trying to go out and get a $20,000 vehicle if you, can't, if you can't even get a $1,000 loan from Best Buy in your own name. Right? Think about it. I mean, this should be common sense. And people that are well intending, that are trying to be good to help other people, often don't use wisdom because they're acting by emotion. Notice he talks about a friend here. But he also mentions a stranger. It could be an and or situation here. Let's read it again. My son... If thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. So imagine, you know, you say, hey, come with me down to Bubba's car lot. Well, I don't know Bubba. Yeah, but it's okay. I need you to sign on the dotted line for me, right? If you've done that, the Bible gives us instruction here. We need to get out of that situation or fix this situation. Better yet, he's giving us words of wisdom to a young man that he doesn't end up in this situation. The time, you know, we're going to look at this word sure in a couple places in Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 11, just a few, few pages ahead. Proverbs chapter 11, look at verse 15. So remember, surety means like guarantee, I think is a good definition for that, or, or swearing a promise of debt. Verse 15, it says, He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship, suretyship is sure. What's he saying here? A couple things. If you hate for swearing for debt, then you're a faithful person. Think about what he's saying. If, if you hate suretyship, if you hate guaranteeing somebody else's debt, you're probably a faithful person already. It's the person that's carefree and careless, especially with other people's stuff, that they, they are not sure. They are not faithful. They are not true to their word. And, and that's kind of the warning here. This phrase that he says, for a stranger shall smart for it. This is the only place in the Bible the word smart is used. Smart has multiple definitions, especially today as everything is a smart. You know, this is a smart coffee mug now. It has a timer on it. My, it, it tells my cell phone when I need more coffee. You know, my, my refrigerator is smart. My car is smart. And the missiles are smart. You know, but smart has multiple definitions. I want to read one of them to you. This is entry two of four for the word smart. To cause or to be the cause or seat of a sharp stinging pain also. To feel or to have such pain. Right? So if you're swearing or if you're a guarantee for a stranger, it's going to hurt. It's going to sting. There's going to be some pain. It goes on in this definition, it says, to feel or in endure distress, remorse, or embarrassment, smarting for wounded vanity. How much the more? Well, you know, they didn't accept my credit score. But don't worry, I know brother so-and-so, he'll sign for me, he'll swear for me, he'll be sure for my debt, I'll go get him, Mr. Bubba Carman. Right? And then because of their wounded vanity, they go and get you. They drag you down there. You put your name on the dotted line. Now you own that vehicle even though you're not paying for it. 
right? And it is going to hurt you. He says, to feel or endure distress or remorse. One last definition they use is, to pay a heavy or stinging penalty would have to smart for his foolishness. So what is the Bible saying here? If you go out and you forswear yourself on somebody else's behalf, it will cost you, it will hurt, you're going to have to pay for it. Is there anybody in here that can guarantee that tomorrow that I will do X, Y, and Z? Think about what I'm saying. You can't guarantee what I'm going to do. I can't guarantee what you're going to do. If I acted on emotion and you said, but I promise, I'm excited, tomorrow we're gonna do, I'm going to do this, right? You're forswearing yourself, and I, I believe it. I buy, yeah, I buy into the excitement, and I say, okay. And then guess what? You fall through. I've hurt myself. So he's warning us about forswearing ourselves. And children, listen, you should be careful about borrowing money or lending money or destroying your reputation financially so that you have to have other people to borrow money from because you can't borrow it from the bank. Look, the banks will give any deadbeat money. They will give just about anybody deadbeat, you know, I mean, at 26% interest, they'll give anybody some money. You know, so be careful so to, and to never have to bring a friend into something that's not really God's purpose. You ought to have some wisdom and maybe live below not your means, but your desires. Yeah. And today, too many people, they want the biggest, the baddest, the hottest, the fastest, the coolest. Forget about all that. Just get what you need and be happy with what you have. Right. You know, just, just, you know, too many times people are shooting for the stars and, well, I can't get a $20,000 vehicle. What do I do? Well, I passed one today, $800, man. Go get that thing. It's ugly. It sounds funny. It probably smells on the inside, but it'll get you back and forth to work. So, you know, there's always another option. Go move to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. Look at verse number 18. A man void of understanding striketh hands. Now he uses this because remember in, in Proverbs 6 where he at, he says, If thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. Imagine, here, come here, come here, brother Alex. Do you promise we make a deal? Yeah, All right, we got a handshake. We got a deal, right? That's what he's talking about, making a deal, making a handshake, making a promise, right? You're striking hands. You're saying, okay, it's a deal. We're, we're, it's going to happen. So in Proverbs 17, 18, he says, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. Go to chapter 20. So a lot of times it is emotional. It's like, well, I don't want my friend to think I can't do this or afford this. You know, hey, humble yourself. Be proud that you're poor. If that's your situation, say, you know what? No, it is what it is, and I'll take what I got. You know, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Look at Proverbs 20, verse number 16. Here's a warning. It says, take his garment that is surety for a stranger, and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. Right? Oh, man, I got my new girlfriend, and I, we need, we're trying to get in, and I need this or that. Uh, 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 you're going to give me a pledge because you're probably not going to fall through, right? Oh, I tell you, just give me, the, you know, give, me, uh, give me that gold coin that you're sitting on that you won't cash. I'll hold that, and when you pay off your debt, I'll give it back to you. Right? He's saying take their garment. Take a pledge when somebody is not trustworthy. If you do, take a guarantee from them. Go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. How, how should we handle our business? Look at verse 26. Be not one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. Do not forswear yourself for debts that you don't need, that you can't handle. If you know you can't pay it, don't take it. If you say, well, you know, they're going to give me three months free. I don't know how we're going to pay it after that. You might want to reconsider what you're doing. But seriously, I mean, people do it all the time. They're not looking in the future. They're not being faithful in their finances. And because of the incentive, because of the deal, because of the down payment, they don't look at what it costs them in the future. There is a difference between the price and the cost. You understand what I'm saying? If you go down right now and you say, I'm, I'm going to give me that brand new Toyota truck, it's $20,000. That's the price. I think I can afford that over the next five years. Well, what's the actual cost? Well, over the next five years, you might pay $30,000 for that same truck. Can you afford the actual cost of it? You understand, there's taxes on it, there's a tag on it. And too many times people say, oh, well, I got, X, I got $1,000, I'm going to buy a car, I'm gonna get a $1,000 car. Well, you might wanna get a $700 car, you're gonna need the extra money to get the tires, the battery, the title, the license plate. Think about this, the insurance, those are all things that are included. Go to Proverbs chapter 27. 
Proverbs chapter 27. Look at verse number 13. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger, and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. Go back to Proverbs chapter 6. You obviously see a pattern here. Back and forth, you see it about warning about if, you, if a, you're taking a pledge from a stranger, be warned, you better hold on to something. And in the same way it says, you should not be one of these people. You should not be forswearing yourself or promising things that you can't do. The message here is that we need to be faithful with our promises. The Bible tells us not to, to forswear ourselves. He says, swear not. Right? We shouldn't swear. Well, I swear by my mama's grave. Well, be careful. Right? People often, and I hate this one. Oh, I swear to God. Whoa, you watch your mouth. Most, I, I have found a lot of people that say that statement tend to exaggerate, yeah. tend to just be lying and bragging, and they think, well, what can I say that will make them realize that I'm serious? Even though they're lying, they're going to swear on God. Right? That's wicked. That is a wicked thing to say. When somebody says that, I don't care what the context is, as a Christian, you should tell them to shut their mouth. You should say, don't swear by God. You can't swear by God. Who are you to swear by God? Think about it. In the Bible, he, the phrase, oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, right? The Lord, we pray to the Lord by saying, oh my God. Not because of an emotional response or I stub my toe. Or you shouldn't be saying, oh, I swear to God, I'm going to do X. Whoa, you better watch yourself. When you make a vow to God, when you start swearing to God, God might just come down and, and cash that in. You might find yourself hurting in a way you didn't expect because you're lying by the name of God. Be careful when somebody says that. Let's pick up in verse number 2 where we left off. He says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. He says it twice. Right? What's he saying? Keep your promises. If you say you're going to do something, do it. When you open your mouth and you say you're going to do something, you are snared, you're trapped by your own words. Right? And in and, and salvation, we know a false prophet by the fruit of his words. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. It's by your confession, we know what you really believe. And obviously, people lie and try to deceive, but ultimately, they end up telling on themselves. And the Bible here is saying, keep your promises, don't swear, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And if somebody asks you to do something and you feel emotional like you really do want to help them, you feel compelled to say yes, but you're not ready to say no, you just need to say, let me get back to you on it. At least have enough gumption to say, hey, I, you know what, I can't really answer that right now. Let me think about it. Let me, let me check with my wife. Let me look at my calendar. Let me pray about it. But I'm not going to tell you yes now and regret it later because then I'm going to, I've forsworn myself. I already made a promise. Then I have to keep it. Look at verse number three. It says, do this now, my son. And deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. What's he saying here? Like, if you have, if there's somebody in here, and if there is, I don't know, but let's say, Brother Marcel, you said, you know what, Brother Fan, and I did it. I signed up for somebody else. They're, uh, they're on my name and my social security number, on my credit. I signed up so they could get a brand new car. And what the Bible says is, then you need to go to your friend. You need to humble yourself. You, need to say, you know what? The Bible says I shouldn't do this. And I want to get it right. I want to get my name off of that. It's been six months. Is your credit better? You've made your payments. Let's see if we can refinance this thing and get my name off of it because I don't need that on me. I, I've got my own life and my own uses for credit and I'm trying to do my own thing. So I need to go ahead and separate. I'm sorry. I, should have, I shouldn't have done this to begin with, but I'm glad I helped. You know what I mean? And if you're stuck, you're stuck. You've already promised. But you ought to try to get out of a situation if you put yourself in one. Look at verse number 4. Give not sleep to thine eyelids, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Right? Sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. In other words, do it quickly. Don't play around. Don't waste time. Well, we'll give him another six months and see if he just keeps paying it. Hopefully that's okay. No, you, don't, you ought to go solve it now and get your name off of it. Verse 5. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. He's saying, deliver thyself as, as you're in the hand of the creditor, because he's got you. He's got your name and your number and your stuff. He's got you. Deliver yourself out of his hand, because you don't have the goods. It wasn't for you. It was for a friend, right? You know, it's funny. This just happened at the, at the Marching to Zion conference. We, the first night we get there, and we drove all night to get there, and we spent all day doing stuff. We had a great time. I was up late working on a video. 
and then the air conditioner about two o'clock in the morning just started making this crazy noise. I could not sleep. I might have gotten two or three hours of sleep. So the second day I was wore out. And at the end of the second day, they're beginning to wrap things up. And I just look at my wife, I'm like, let's go, we're done. Like, I'm going to bed right now, we're done. And I go back and I take my suit and tie off and I get in bed and I'm trying to, I got a pillow over my head, trying not to hear this air conditioner and, and I'm trying to go to sleep and I get a phone call. Hey, Brother Fannin, remember you said I could borrow that tripod? I'll be right there. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm on like zero sleep. I am wore out. I probably look like a zombie, you know. I get back, I put my suit back on. I get out there. I take all my gear. I go help this guy with his camera thing. And it was a blessing. I was, I was, it was a blessing to be there. It was a blessing to participate. It was a, it was, I was a blessing to him. But, you know, the true blessing is because I, did, I kept my word. I kept my word. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't care if I felt sick. I don't care if my head was hurting. I promised I would help at that time. And I didn't make it enough of a priority to remember at the time. So when it came to, uh, you know what? I got to make this right. I got to do it, right? Took longer than I wanted. I had to do more than I thought, but that's okay. I kept my word. God will bless that. That's what matters. And that's the type of people that we ought to be. People that can be trusted, people that can be dependable, faithful people, being countable. You know, we, we can count on you to be faithful. That's the kind of Christian God wants us to be. You know, Proverbs 15, we know we sing the song, but it says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Think about that. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. If you make a promise, and then when it comes time to pay, you're like, ooh, that's going to hurt. Oh, no, that's going to leave me broke for the month. Well, yeah, you made your work. You promised. You said you were going to do it. You better make it right. You better find a way to make it right. Don't back out of your promises. Look at verse number 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Right? The ants are hard-working little creatures, aren't they? They are busy all the time. They don't get distracted. They don't have somebody telling them what they're building. What they, they just do what they know they ought to do. And wisdom is to work hard at whatever job you have. And I don't care if it's a difficult job or you're just a peon, you're low in the totem pole. Don't wait for the promotion. Work hard now. Act like you own the place. Act like you run the place. Work like you're working for God and He will reward you. He'll take it. If no one else sees you and no one else appreciates what you're doing, right? And some of you work and you, Brother Marcel, you know, we've talked about this before and he said, you know, I'm out working in a lawn and I get it right up to the corner and I don't have enough to get to it. And I'm like, well... No, you know, hold on. It's going to take five minutes. It's going to take ten minutes. I'm going to do it right. I'm working for God. I want to please Him. I want to do it right. And we all have that same attitude. We all ought to have that same mentality that I'm going to finish the job, even if that means, well, well my, my numbers aren't, my stats don't look as good. It took me longer. You know, hey, you ought to do it right the first time, even if it hurts. You ought to be the best type of worker you can. They go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. The ant, she is a hard worker. The Bible says, watch that, do what she does, and you will be a wise person. Work like you own the business. Work like winter is coming. Work like you may not have a job next month and you need to do the best you can right now. Work like they're going to cut and lay off half the people next month and they're going to decide based on what they're watching today. Again, work like you're working for the Lord. Look at verse 7. Of these ants, she says, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. He's saying, don't be idle when the boss ain't around. The, the ants don't have to have the queen standing over them saying, get back to work. How long have you been on break here? Hey, we need this taken care of. We got to keep digging. We got to keep building. Right? The ants don't, they just do what they're supposed to do. They do it well, even if it hurts. Ants will literally work themselves to death. And hey, as, as men, you need to work yourself with that mentality of, well, I'm going to work to provide life for my family, even if it wears me out, Amen. even if it stresses me to the max. Even, I had to skip lunch again. Wait, is mama eating? Because if she is, that's successful. Amen. If daddy's eating one meal a day, but mama's eating three, hey, praise the Lord, mama's eating three. Praise the Lord, those kids are being fed. You need to work. You know, in Colossians 3, he says, to servants, which are employees, the servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Not just saying, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, really doing it. Not just faking it with your eyes. 
He says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. Whatsoever you do. If in your spare time you have a hobby of working with wood and you're just tinkering around, you better do the best job you can. You need to work with skill. You need to work to the best you can on everything you do in life. God has given you the ability. God has given you supernatural wisdom through the Holy Spirit, and you have access to it. And if you just shrug it all, it's no big deal. I'll cut this corner. Nobody cares. I'm the only one that's going to see it. Right? Or what's the old job, the, the, the joke on the job site? You can't see it from my house. I know that. Boy, that thing sure does look crooked. Yeah, you can't see it from my house. I don't care. Well, not my problem. Look, that's not Christian-like. That's not wisdom that God's trying to teach us here. Look at verse number 8. It says, Provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Right? An ant is working for a goal. An ant is working to provide for her own, to make sure there's food when the food is not available out on the ground. In 1 Timothy 5, he says, If any provide not for his own, especially they of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. There is nothing worse than than a Christian that refuses to work and gets on welfare, or refuses to work at all and wants to borrow from other people, refuses to take, take care of their responsibilities, and they're always looking for some other person to try to take care of their business. Look, man up and take care of your own business. We need to be faithful at work. We need to be faithful in our finances, or what these verses are teaching. Look at the next verse, verse number 9. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When will thou arise out of thy sleep? Now, you know, this, this is kind of an interesting verse because I want you to think about in the time that this was written, they didn't have a television, right? Today, most people, they just chill out. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just killing time. What are you doing? Right? Or just hanging out, wasting time. We're watching TV. We're relaxing. Right? So back then, people, he's, like these people, same types of people probably are saying, how long will you sleep, O oh sluggard, when will you arise out of thy sleep? People just laying around not doing anything when there's work to be done. Right? And the same thing, if, if you just sit around, I mean, even when you get home, mom or dad, when you, when you get home and there's things to do, and you say, well, we're just going to kick back and watch some TV. Whoa, what are you doing with your time? What are you investing your time into? Because you're investing it in what the world has created to convince you of the doctrine of the Pharisees, to get that leaven in your mind, to accept sin, to stop following God, to not be righteous. You're putting this leaven in your eyes, it goes down into your heart, instead of doing something productive. There's a million other things you can do. If you really have no, I mean, you have nothing to do, and every, all, everything's taken care of, you got that much free time, why don't you develop a new skill? Why don't you build a new hobby? I mean, how many people would say, well, I work eight hours a day, and I'm in a dead-end job, and I'm just doing what I can, and I get home and I watch TV. Those same people, if they were wise, they would spend two or three hours a night studying to get another job, to develop a skill, to learn a craft or a trade. I mean, you know how many, I mean, and all of you men probably know somebody like this, a man that just starts working on wood a little bit in their garage. They start fiddling with this and that, and next thing you know, they're building just beautiful pieces of artwork, beautiful functional things. They have all this skill they developed over time because they've studied it out, they've worked on it, they've, they've collected their tools, they're developing their school, their, their, their skill, and then if they want, they could go get a job doing that. You know, and a lot, instead of sitting, well, I'm done for the day, I clocked out, so now it's time for me to clock out mentally, to punch out spiritually and stop worrying about my growth. Look, we ought to make a plan for what we're going to learn spiritually and physically. Look what he says in verse 10. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Thy want, thy desire, is going to sneak up on you and you weren't ready. He says, your poverty will come as a man that traveleth, one that traveleth. You know, we had a visitor a few weeks ago. He didn't call and tell us. He didn't announce himself. He just showed up. We didn't know what time to expect him. We didn't know he was coming. We didn't even know his name. Right? That's what it's telling us here. It's like a man that's traveling and there's no announcement, there's no warning. Suddenly poverty shows up. Why? Because you're just a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding to the hands to rest. 
instead of being diligent with your time, instead of investing in your growth. Go to Proverbs 24. This phrase is used in Proverbs 24. In Romans 13 it says, and that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. In Romans he's saying, hey, wake up. It's not nighttime, it's daytime, but the night is coming. Right, that old hymn, work for the night is coming. Are you working like that? Are you working toward being a better Christian? Are you working on your family? We need to get work for God. We gotta get to work. There's stuff that God wants us to do, and we have to purpose to get it done. It's not going to happen by accident. The only way you're going to accomplish these things are to make goals. I guarantee you, if you took a survey of the top ten self-made millionaires, they would not tell you it happened by accident. They would tell you they purposed, they worked, they strived, they made goals, they tried and tried and tried until they were successful. Look, and I'm not telling you you all need to be millionaires. Feed me with food that's convenient for me. Lord, give me what you have for me. In the meantime, I need to search after that. I need to get better and better. Look, you're in Proverbs 24. Look at verse number 27. I love this verse, Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare thy work without, and make it fit for thyself in the field. And afterwards, build thine house. What's he saying? Prepare your work out, without, outside. Get your work lined up. Get your skills lined up. Figure out what you have to do in life to take care of business. He says, make it fit for thyself. Make sure it's something you can handle. Get yourself ready to be able to do these accomplishments. Look, you need to make a plan in life. I'm telling you, we have to have a plan in life. You have to have some sort of a goal or you'll never obtain it. For years, I sat back and I listened to Pastor Anderson. I said, one day I'm going to go to Phoenix. One day I'm going to get involved. One day I'll get back on fire for God like I used to be. One day I'll take all this knowledge I've been studying and put it to use. I'll go out and help some people and I'll be a strong soul winner again. In the meantime, I'm bouncing around from dead church to dead church with no soul winning, no passion, no zeal. And it wasn't until I set a date. Hey, you know what? I'm moving. I'm going. And shortly after I set that date, I ended up changing my focus and my goals to go to Fort Worth. But, you know, it's not where I ended up that matters. It's that I decided, hey, you know what? I'm, I have a deadline. To get there, I need to save. To get there, I need to prepare. I had to liquidate. I had to purge some stuff. I had to get rid of some friends. I had to get rid of some, some, some stupid mentalities or attitudes or problems. I had to get rid of my own stuff so I could do something for God. Right? And he's saying here, prepare thy work without. Make it fit for thyself in the field. We need to have a plan for life. We need to set goals. He says, afterwards, build thine house. So don't make the goal, first of all, well, I got to get a big, I got to get a house, and then I'll figure out a job. No, get a job, then figure out a house, right? We as Christians need to set a goal for Bible reading. As Christians in the family, we need to set a goal for what we're going to accomplish, how many pages a day, how many minutes a day, how many hours, whatever it is you're trying to, you need to have an obtainable goal, and it has to be measurable so you can do a calculation and figure out how much work you have to put in. So there's no way I can put a full hour in. All I can do is half an hour. Okay, great. Where's that going to get you? Because don't think you can put 15 minutes in a day and read the Bible five or six times a year. It won't happen. It just won't happen. You'll be disappointed. You'll get discouraged. You'll be disheartened. You'll give up. Right? Set a goal that is fit for thyself, as it says in this verse. As Christians also, we need to use the wisdom of the world and, and let the Holy Spirit guide us. We need some financial goals. We need to have some savings in our life. We need to have a, a, where, we're going, where we're coming from, where we're going to. We need to figure out how we're going to get the things we need for our family. And, and you need to, you're not going to do it without a goal. It's not just going to happen by accident. But really, as a family... We all need to have goals for the growth of our family. We need to have doctrinal goals. We need to have Bible reading goals. We need to have goals of, well, you know, we're, we're failing at having family devotion time. We're going to get that on lockdown this year. We're going to start by one day a week. We're going to double down and make it two days a week. We're going to get it every night of the week. Figure out what your goals are, where you're trying to get, and what you have to do. Because as a family, it's the husband's responsibility to teach the wife 
and you sometimes you you can do it just through conversation but it's better just to have a plan and say you know what I want to make sure you understand this chapter I'm gonna work with my wife through the book of Matthew through the book of Romans through the book of John so that we though she can open it up and say I know what that means think about it like as a man this is what you ought to be doing is preparing yourself to, to teach your wife and if you're doing that every week then you're better off because then you can teach others you know in Luke 14 Jesus said for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he has sufficient to finish it lest happily after with, when he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it all that behold it began to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish right what, what wisdom is trying to teach us what God is trying to teach us here is make a plan make it fit for yourself make it obtainable and measurable figure out what you have to do day in and day out to get where you want to be in a year's time or five years time or by the end of your life look it's a good thing to have some vision and it helps your family look at verse number 30 I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding and lo it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down then I saw it and considered it well I looked upon it and received instruction I go by and here's somebody's property it's broken over it's ran over with weeds and vines and you can tell the, the, the walls falling down the house is in decay I looked at it I considered it I chewed on it mentally and I understood something this guy is void of understanding this guy doesn't have wisdom he's not taking care of uh, he's not being a good steward right God has made us all stewards over certain things some of you children the only thing you have a stewardship over is a box of Legos hey be a good steward over those Legos right some of you have are stewards over multiple properties or businesses some of you are a steward over family and children and lives and vehicles houses whatever God's given you be a good steward over it consider what other what happens to other people you know I knew a guy back in the day and he refused to change his oil and he loved to brag about it now often now I, I gotta admit because I got a chuckle out of it I used to have this little Ford Ranger and I didn't change my all my, my oil as often as I should because I was broke right but this guy bragged that he never changed it he didn't care and he was gonna run it in the ground and then trade it in what a fool what a fool that was wasteful in fact you know where we live right now there's a house next to us when we moved in my wife thought that this movie was straight out of like one of those horror movies it was creepy looking there was stuff growing all over it there literally there were there were trees and vines and all these barns and you can sort of see it was really creepy it was a very strange situation when we flew in here to to get the church started we found the house the guy that owned that house was alive at the time he was a tree trimmer and yet I'm telling you his house was the worst on the block hadn't trimmed any of the trees the vines I'm telling the vines this big that actually went under the fence into our yard I pulled them up I mean I'm, I'm not joking vines this big well he died he had cancer he didn't take care of himself his ex-wife whom he had not been taking care of business there either had to come in and make sense of the mess his son that didn't want to take care of it either came in and tried to take care of it this house last sold for over two hundred thousand dollars and it sat there and it stank and it looked ugly it was creepy and then finally it sells for less than thirty thousand dollars this house he bought it for two hundred and twenty thousand dollars and then somebody came in and they bought it for let for twenty nine thousand dollars they've had to tear out every piece of wall they've had to tear out every piece of flooring the air conditioning the roof I don't know how many trees 20 30 trees the sewage system the electrical the driveway literally they've had to take everything out of this house it might be a good house when it's done they've had to replace the, the they took all the barns out they, they've replaced the fence and you know I mean what a waste this man worked and paid a mortgage to pay off this house for two hundred and twenty thousand dollars to the point that he died he didn't take care of his family he didn't take care of his house 
and he left it to somebody that didn't care, they've had to just about, they about demolished it. It's, he's actually a little bit cheaper to just rip everything else out and rebuild it up than to build a new one and go through all the permitting. That's foolishness. That's something we can look at and consider and say, you know what? It's not wisdom, it's not wise to be a bad steward. That is not faithfulness to let something fall apart. Laziness destroys blessings in people's lives. In Ecclesiastes 10 he says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. This guy came home and watched TV and just sat there with idle hands and let his house fall apart, let his health go, let his family just fall away. What a sad life. I mean, I never met the man, but I, I, I see the aftermath. I've met his ex-wife, and I've seen everything that's happened in this process. There's a lesson to be learned there. Be diligent in what you have. Be a good steward in the little things that you have, and then God will give you more. You say, well, I don't have a whole lot. Well, be good with what little you got so it's not taken from you. Do the best you can with what you have, and God will bless you with more. Look at verse 33 in this chapter, Proverbs 24, 33. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Go back to Proverbs chapter 6. Same thing that we saw in Proverbs chapter 6. It's going to sneak up on you. You, don't know, you won't know where it came from. But it happened because a little bit of this, a little bit of laziness, a little bit of sleeping, a little bit of relaxing, a little bit of TV watching, and all of a sudden, 10 years from now, you don't have any more skill. All of a sudden, 10 years from now, your children don't know the Bible. Your wife doesn't know the Bible. You haven't read through the Bible yourself because you've wasted time. You need to purpose in your heart to set goals and be faithful to those goals. Don't put off for tomorrow what can be done today. There's so many things that are, it would only take a few minutes, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow, I'll get to it next, hey, just do it, be done. Get it off your list and move forward in life. Look at Proverbs 6, verse number 12, where we left off. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. Now remember, froward means perverse or crooked. So he's saying a naughty person has a crooked mouth. They're talking about crooked things and perverse things. They're crooked in their ways. They're dishonest. They're not keeping their word. They're not paying their debts in context of this chapter. Look at the next verse. It says, He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Now, I don't think that means, you know, if you're using your hands while you're preaching, that makes you an evil person, right? I think what he's saying is he's trying to distract. You think about the magician. What's the magician do? Watch this hand while this one gets your wallet, right? A little slide of hand, a little, trust me, you can trust me, I'm okay, right? If it's somebody that's being sly, that's using distractions because their ways are crooked. Their thoughts are in, intentionally to harm you. Look at verse 14, it says, Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. So what's the fruit of this, right? He's crooked in his heart. From the inside out, he's crooked. He's devising mischief. He's always calculating, come up with some sort of an idea. You know, it's funny, I used to work for a guy, and he was sort of like that. And he was always, oh, I got an idea. You know what we could do? I could do this and trick somebody. And I'm like, no, that's not right. And I would tell him, and he was like 60 years old, and he would take it as an offense. No, I'm not saying, you know, I'm just trying to come up with an idea. I'm like, no, you're crooked. I'm getting away from you, right? Because when you're around a crooked person, you're next. You're on the list. It's only a matter of time. And, and truly it was with that guy. But you know, it, it says, also the last thing here he says, he soweth discord. The Lord hates discord among the brethren. He soweth discord. He's trying to separate chief friends. Right? He want, God hates church splitters. Look, he gets into this. Discord by subversion is what it makes me think about. You know, subvert is to like trick somebody. Or, or like the devil, with subtlety, he deceived Eve, right? It was subtlety. He was being subversive, like under the table. Look at verse 15. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Right? God's going to break his back. And people like this, you let God avenge them. Hey, Lord, you deal with that. Lord, this guy did me wrong. Would you get him? And let me just be righteous. I, I'm, I'm going to forgive the debt. And you go collect it. You take care of it. And I, I know you'll, try, you'll take care of it. Look at verse 16. 
These six things that the Lord hate. Wait, God hates? Is, it, is, is that right? Is that, in, is that in your Bible? The Lord hates. God hates things and He wants us to hate things. If there's a list here from God, He says there are six things that I really hate. Think about this. If your boss said, there are six things on, the, on a job that I hate to find. Don't leave your trash behind. You know, you got to use politeness with customers. If there's certain things and you said, okay, I'll keep my job if I do those six things, right? We would try to do it. If your husband or your wife said, there are six things that I hate. Listen, wife, there's six things that I hate. Meatloaf, liver, <laughs> right? <laughs> pork chops, right? But if you give her a list, you, oh, you're not going to accidentally, oh, look, there's pork chops. You know what I mean? God is telling us he hates things. And for us to be in balance with God and to be righteous with God, what do you think our attitude needs to be to, toward these things? We have to hate them as well. Look at this list. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. That means number seven is the worst. It's like, boy, there's certain things that get me going, but then this one thing, man, I tell you what. It's like <laughs> the Lord is saying, I hate these, and then these other things, that's too much. It's too much. He can't stand it. Look what he says. Verse 17, a proud look. Right? Oh, Jacksonville pride. Rip that stupid t-shirt and that smug off your face. Right? <laughs> look, God wants to protect the innocent. God loves the innocent. God loves things that are pure. He hates people that try to harm others. This is why God hates things. Because He loves purity. He loves the innocent. He loves the children. And He hates those that would try to harm them. Look, as Christians, we've got to be careful of pride. This is how the devil will try to get us. We're, run, we're reading through Proverbs. We're asking for wisdom. You need to make your daily prayer, Lord, give me wisdom. But right here, the warning that God hates pride, we need to make sure we're asking for humility as well. Lord, help me to be humble. Lord, I know I'm the most humble guy in the church. And if everybody could just catch up to me, fail, right? Lord, help me to remain humble. Wait a minute. I'm not humble. Lord, help me to be humble. Help me to get humble. Lord, help me to have a right attitude about who I am and not be puffed up. Lord, help me to help others, right? Ask the Lord every day for wisdom and humility. A proud look, he says, a lying tongue. That's your movie actors. That's that person that's always exaggerating that can never shut their mouth. A lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. That's your abortion doctors. God hates abortion. God hates birth control. God hates that system that justifies it, the insurance companies. I know a young man that, that's a programmer, and he's a new IFB guy, and he telling me about his situation. I've talked to him on the phone several times, and, and you guys may know him, but I won't talk about him. I don't have his permission, but he called me up one night, and he said, look, I just found out that my company is using this medical billing software that I've developed to support abortion. They're funding this abortion, like, it's being used in a whole other way that I had no idea. I mean, I'm just making it for this, but everybody, now their primary vendor is abortion clinics. I don't know what to do. I don't feel right. I said, well, you're not committing abortion, but if you don't feel right about it, then you need to get out of there. Just take a walk. If you're that skilled to build that kind of program, well, I know if I leave, they're going to have problems. Well, that's their problem. They should, and you tell them, and he did. He went and told him. He said, well, you know what? I am not going to work for abortion. That's wicked. It goes, I, I'm not building a system. I'm not going to support a system. I'm not going to help the hands that are hurting the innocent. I believe God's rewarding for that. I believe God rewarding greatly in heaven. Look at verse 18. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Can you say Comic Con, sci-fi, movies, fantasy, covetousness, adultery in your heart, just fascinated with violence. Oh man, this war movie, it was so good. You could see their limbs ripping apart. That's not right. That doesn't make God happy. That's not good. Desensitizing people to hurting others and making them think it's acceptable. Most people, when they see an actual wreck or an actual fight or even an actual gunshot, they're amazed. Well, I thought there would be this big explosion, and I thought, it, you know, the sound effects, it was just pop. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to real life. All right, look, television is full of liars. It's deceiving people. It's de and, and video games are, are just wicked as hell. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. The violent video games that are corrupting the minds of our youth, and then they put them on some psychotropic drug, and next thing you know, they're shooting people like they did here in Jacksonville. Well, we don't know what caused it. I do. Video games, drugs, the devil entered into his heart. When you open yourself up to all that foolishness, it's only a matter of time before you do something stupid, say something stupid. I, mean, I want to see some of these little video game nerds actually try to pick a fight with a real man. Yeah. Oh, I've played, I can box, I can fight, I can kick you, and then, oh, yeah, <laughs> lay, on the, lay in your own blood for a little bit and consider the reality of violence, of hurting people. It's wicked when you devise imaginations of hurting people. What's he say next? Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. I heard there's a riot in the street. They're looting the candy. Let's go get the gas station. Come on. Come with me. Right? If you're, if you're joining in with somebody doing something evil, that's foolish. God hates that. Well, come on, hurry. Put on a mask. You can get away with it. No. That's wrong in God's eyes. Don't be quick to join evildoers. Swift to running to mischief. You should not quickly enter in with somebody else. You, should, you don't partner up with thieves. You get hurt. Look at the last thing he says here. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. False witness that speaketh lies. A liar. A lawyer. A lawyer. Do you think God loves lawyers? Now look, I know there are lawyers that just push paper. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting everybody in one category, but the majority of lawyers, they are professional liars. They brag about having that title. If you're a salesperson and you brag about calling yourself a professional liar, or if you're a movie actor and you call yourself a professional liar, God hates you. God hates that attitude. If you're promising something and doing something wrong, or you know somebody's guilty and you won't let them be condemned, you're lying about it or finding some way to twist the law or to change the truth, God's wrath is upon you. And they think they can get away with it, and they wonder why they're not happy at home, and why, why the, the money never does it. It'll catch up with them. Their soul is vexed, and some of them, I mean, they've crossed the line. But, you know, also gossipers, a false witness that speaketh lies. Look, this is something we all, every one of us, have to be careful of. We have to be real careful. Did you hear that brother so-and-so? Really? I wouldn't have thought he would. Hey, did you hear that? Bro Whoa. What if that's a lie, and now you've become a false witness by repeating something you can't verify? Look, we all have to be careful about what we say. This is very important. God warns us over and over and over. And so we're all probably going to be humbled at some point and say, ah, you know what? I was wrong. I said something I didn't know to be true. I said something that was wrong. I, I exaggerated. I stretched the truth. Yeah, I lied. I'm sorry. Be a man and fess up to it, but get it right. Wouldn't it be terrible if you found out somebody was lying about you and it was not even intentional? They were just repeating what they heard? Wouldn't that be terrible if a friend or somebody in here, you heard that they were saying that you were in sin? Well, I heard he was a drunkard. Really? Where'd you hear that? Well, I don't know. I can't say. Well, then we got a problem. Whoa, we got a problem. You heard he was a drunkard. Hey, get over here. We need to talk about this. Right? Because what if, in fact, it was the opposite? What if they were saying how much they hate drinking and somebody overheard them and they're defending drinking? Did you know they're a drunkard? Right? You know that old telephone game, the next thing? Did you know every weekend he's out at the bar? Look, this is how it happens. And we need to be careful of gossiping and lying in the church because we love each other. We are all a family here. God has jointly fit us together. He has set every member in here as it pleases him. And when you attack another member, you're going against what God's doing. Here, there are people in here that are not where you're at. Right? Well, my spiritual growth, I'm up to here. And this guy down here, do you know he still does? Okay, well, is he trying to move up? Does he love God? Is he a soul winner? Is he reading the Bible? Is he saved? Is he trying to get better? Because you, you've, you're bringing yourself down when you start gossiping. When you start lying about that person, you're going the opposite direction. There are people that are not at the same point you are in life. And a lot of times, especially in, in the new IFB churches, this is a problem where there are people that are coming out of a worldly lifestyle. They still have one foot in, one foot out. They still have half their family, half their friends, and they're trying to get it all right. They're trying to juggle it all. And you've got it all figured out already. And you want to let everybody know that they're messed up. They, oh, they're still in sin. Oh, would you know that 
They, he, he lets his daughter cut her hair. Oh, do you know they still wear, hey, who, who cares? Leave that alone. Leave it alone. Some of these things are best just left alone. And look, we're going to preach whatever God says. I'm going to preach against drunkenness. I'm going to preach against women wearing pants, women having short hair, men having long hair. But if a guy walks in here and he's got long hair, and he's saved and he's trying to serve the Lord, he wants to be a soul winner, I'm not going to make it my personal vendetta to get him every week. I want them to grow. I want to preach. We're going to preach through it. We're going to say it every year. We're going to come through it. And in the meantime, don't be judgmental of people if they're not where you're at. Don't become a gossiper because then you're a false witness telling lies about somebody and all you're really doing was repeating something you didn't verify. If somebody comes to you with something that's so outrageous, then deal with, hey, what, really? Hey, come on over here. We need to talk. Here, let's go to them right now and watch them shut up. Right? Go to the person that's in question because if they're really a brother and they're really, you really want to help them, you help them not by spreading gossip, but by confronting the sin if it's sin. And if you find out it wasn't sin, you help them by stopping the false witness. Look, we as Christians got to get really good at this, at helping each other by not saying things we ought not. And it applies to everybody. It applies to me as well. I'm a human being. My tongue, it, it's the smallest member. And guess what? It can start fires just like yours. We all need to grow in this. Look at the last thing that he says here. This is the one that he considers an abomination that he hates the most. And he that soweth discord among brethren... He that soweth discord among brethren. And again, it, that ties in with the gossip. If you're, try, if you're sowing discord among the brethren in the church, God doesn't just hate you. He thinks what you're doing is an abomination. He, he says, you're worthy of my wrath and my correction if you're trying to separate people in the church, causing discord, causing a rift. Well, I like doing it my way. I'll do it my Hey, you need to humble yourself. Pride's not the only problem there. But now you're at the end of the list, the one that God greatly hates. Look at verse 20. He shifts gears here. Right? We need to be faithful in church, I believe, is what some of those verses were applying to. Verse 20, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. So here again, this, this is mentioned earlier in Proverbs, where the father sets the law, so does the mother. When I leave the house, mom is in charge. And if the kids don't obey mom, mom corrects them, and when I get home, I'll correct them. Right? Dad sets that he gives mom the responsibility. She is an authority, and children should obey mom. Children need to be afraid of being corrected by both mom and dad. This, this is out of balance when there's only one corrector. If I just delegated my responsibility, well, honey, you just you spank them, and I'll just love them, then I would be an error according to this scripture. The scripture says that keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. We are both responsible for correction and for love. And too many times parents, they get soft. Well, I don't want to be mean to them. Well, if you love your son, you'll chase them quickly. If you hate your son, you won't. And it is the responsibility of both to, to play that role. And children need to obey, plain and simple. Children, you need to obey mom and dad. Children, you should not, well, mom said, no, I'm going to dad. Dad, can we do this? Oh, sure, go ahead. If you're doing that, you're subverting the authority. Well, but dad said I could. Woe unto you. All right, when mom says no, you say, yes, ma'am. Dad did say I could, but I'll take your, whatever you say goes, mom. Then maybe she'll work with you a little bit. But if you're going from one to the other, what you're actually doing is creating discord in the family. You're putting one parent against the other. And then, I'll, well, did you say they could do that? Because I said this. Well, I thought he did. I thought this. And the next thing you know, the parents are at each other because the, the children are being selfish and not being obedient. When one says no, no goes. Leave it at that. Look at the next verse. Talking of the law, the commandment here, he says, Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. This is the protection that you get from the wisdom of God's word. Hey, when your parents say, hey, don't sleep around. You should wait and be pure and get married. Don't drink. You'll hurt yourself. You'll hurt others. God will be angry with you. If you disobey those commandments, do you think it, when it says, when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee? When thou awakest? Because, I mean, how many times have people been hurt while they're asleep because they're around people doing things their parents said not to do? Here's a warning here. Look at verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, 
and reproofs of instruction are the ways of life. The way to save your life instead of destroy it is to hearken to the wisdom that comes from your parents that is the wisdom of the Word of God. Look at verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Again, warming about harmful people that deceive with their tongue. He said the same thing in the previous chapter. He's going to say the same thing in the next chapter. Look at verse 25. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Young men, be careful. Single men, married men, every man, be careful. There's a woman out there that wants to hurt you and your family, and they're going to do it through their eyes. They're going to flutter their eyelids, and you're, oh, what, I'm special? Look, and this is something we need to teach our children. Our children need to be careful. There are harmful people out there. We need to be cautious of people that, give, that, that have this, this unavided attention. Don't let strangers give your children attention. I don't care. I mean, think about it. There has to be boundaries here. Look, praise is one thing. Your kids did a good job. That's good. But when somebody's paying them extra special attention, oh, you're so special. Oh, I just love, be careful. Look, that's how perverts sneak in. That's how perverts draw away your children. And your children should not always be looking for some special attention. Because this is very dangerous. Kids, be cautious of people. And adults, watch out for the eyes. When people are always looking at things or trying to catch your eyes, this is the way that evil people work. Look at verse 27, or verse 26. He says, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. She'll destroy a whole family, and she doesn't care. She will break the bank. She will get you to forswear yourself, and she doesn't care. Verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can you play with fire and not get burnt? Can you play with fire and not get burned? Look, I mean, that's what he's saying here. When you're around a person like that, you're going to get hurt. You're going to hurt others. The hunting for the precious life, they'll destroy your family. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? And look, man, you can't even, you can't look without getting it in your mind. All the more he's saying you don't touch without it destroying something. You've got to guard your heart. There are filthy people out there that want to destroy the innocent. They want to break apart families and then brag about it afterwards. And, and they'll come out just fine. You know, look, the message here is that we need to be faithful to our family. We need to be faithful to our wife. We need to be faithful to our spouse. Look at verse 29. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whoso toucheth her, shall not be innocent. He said, you know, under God's law, you're worthy of death. The adulterer was worthy of death under God's law. Man do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Under God's law, you steal $100, you pay $700 back. But guess what? You don't have seven lives to give. Under God's law, if you're caught being an adulterer, you're put to death. You're done. You're over. Look what he says in the next verse, 32. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, and he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. It could cost you your life. It could cost you your family. Right in another passage, it says her steps take, they go down to hell. They lead down to hell. What does that mean? It's like hey, there's, a, there's a destruction of having an adulterous affair that can never go back. The harm does not go away. True healing never happens, I don't think. Look at verse 33. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. David was dishonored by his actions with Uriah's wife. After the fact, she's still called Uriah's wife. In the New Testament, you get to the book of Matthew chapter 1, and right there, guess what? And it, and it lists who? Uriah's wife. She's of David, but it says of Uriah. That was never taken away. That blot, that disdain, that dishonor never went away. David was a man after God's own heart, but yet he was still a man in the flesh, and he fell, and he destroyed his own family because of his eyes. And that's exactly the warning here. Look at verse 34. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. And men, we need to be 
jealous over our own wives. We need to be ravished by our own wives. And you think about Job in Job 31. He made a covenant with his eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job was praying for his wife. We see that Job was praying for his daughters. And I think Job, as he walked with God, how was it that Job was able to overcome temptation? Why should I think on a maid? Because he's praying for his daughters. Well, I don't want my daughter to be treated the way the other men talk about women. I'm going to pray for my daughters. I'm going to pray for my kids. I'm going to pray for my wife. I'll be ravished by her. I'm going to protect my eyes. I'm going to guard my heart. I'm not going to let the strange woman take me with her eyes. I'm not going to let her put a noose on my neck. I'm not going to let her destroy my family. Job prayed, and he avoided the covetousness. Look at verse 35, last verse. But talking about the, the jealousy of a husband, right? It said jealousy is the rage of a man in 34. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Look, under God's law, adultery was worthy of death. Imagine, in that time, you're caught, you're busted. The husband grabs you by your neck, he drags you out in the street, he picks up the stones, he bears witness in front of the judges, he throws the first stone, you're stoned to death and you're dead. Look, the law is different today. The law is different today. We're not under God's law. But it has happened where men walk in. Oh, you're with my wife? You're dead. Look, I'm not justifying that because it's not our law. But under God's law, that's justified. There was a process for that. He says, you, wait, wait, don't drag me in front of the judge. Don't stone me, Wayne. Here, I'll give you all my money. I don't want your money. Wait, I'll give you, I'll let you have my, la I don't want your, la I'll let you have my wife and my concubines. I don't want them. You're dead. You're dead. You've just destroyed your family. You've destroyed your life. Man, that's the warning that God have. We need to be faithful in all things. We need to be faithful in our budget, faithful in our words. If we make a promise, we keep it. Faithful at home in training up our children. We need to set goals and try to obtain them. And as Christians, we ought to be faithful in all things. That's the goal. Not a sluggard, not sleepy, not stupid. We need to be smart Christians, and not the way the Bible uses it, obviously. We need to be intelligent, which comes from the knowledge of God, from His wisdom, and obeying what we see. Let's pray. Lord God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for the book of Proverbs. Lord, thank You for the wisdom that we're obtaining by studying it. Lord, I pray that You would help us all to ask You and seek You for wisdom and humility. Lord, help us not to be guilty of the things that you hate. Lord, I pray that you would help us to get more wisdom and knowledge about the things that you love. Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything you're doing here at this church. I pray you continue to bless us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.